Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Today is Tuesday, January 31st, 2023. I'm Steve Shields, president of Royal Asiatic Society of Korea. Thank you for joining us. We welcome all of you who are here in the room and also all those who are joining us by Zoom. We hope that you had a wonderful Korean New Year holiday last week. Did everyone have a good Korean New Year? What? <laughs> well, this is Korea, so it's Korean New Year. Did you eat kook? Uh, duck kook? Everybody have your duck kook? Okay, good. According to the new uh, leadership of the country, it doesn't matter anymore because we're not going to use those ages, I, I suppose. As we get started, I want to express our sincere thanks uh, to the Asia Development Foundation for their generous and continued sponsorship. We uh, also are reminded to put our phones on vibrate. Uh, in addition to Asia Development Foundation, we also appreciate our many other donors, uh, many of our members, <laughs> many of our friends, big or small, uh, the donations are very helpful and, and put to good use. You are cordially reminded that lecture content does not necessarily reflect the opinion or positions of the Royal Asiatic Society Korea. We are joined tonight by RAS Korea President Emeritus, Brother Anthony of Teze. His lecture title is By Blood or by Sweat, Two Kinds of Martyrdom. He'll be talking about the first two Korean Catholic priests, uh, St. Andrew Kim Dagon and Thomas uh, Che, uh, Che Yang Ok, who was the second of the Korean native Korean Catholic priests. And uh, Brother Anthony's translated quite a bit of their written documents, and he'll be sharing with that. The books are available for sale after the meeting. They're 30,000 won each. Uh, they make a really good set of two. Uh, they look should nice. Be, should be a reduced they price. Look, is it a reduced price? Should we reduce the price? Sure. What's our price that we should reduce it to? 20. 20 each. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> if you've already bought books, you get a refund. <laughs> reward for coming. Uh, that's your reward for showing up. Yeah. Um, St. Andrew, Kim Tegon, and Thomas Che were born in the same year. They were the same age. And they walked together all the way to Macau. Can you imagine walking overland from Korea to Macau? That's a little bit of a hike, but they did it. And uh, the, the stories, uh, as you may know, Andrew Kim barely survived a year after his ordination and he was captured and executed. Thomas Che was not able to get into Korea for a few years after that, and he spent 10 years wandering all over the peninsula, uh, sharing the news of uh, his faith. So without uh, further ado, we're gonna turn the time over to Brother Anthony, uh, who many of you already know well, and when he's finished with his presentation, we will have time for questions and answers. So Brother Anthony, welcome. We don't need to see me anyway, so okay. Okay, we start second slide. Yeah. Um no, it's okay. Is that, is that okay to turn them no. off? Can you still turn them off? Turn them off. Turn them off. Turn them off. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. It's off the bar. Okay. Yeah. Andrew Kim and Thomas Che were born in the same year, 1821, and they walked across China together to Macau in 1837 when they were 16. They studied together in Macau, become priests. Then they spent time together in Manchuria waiting for a chance to re-enter Korea. Andrew Kim entered first early in 45, 1845, not yet a priest, and sailed back to Shanghai through a storm 
was ordained as a priest, set off again in the same ship, landed in Korea in October 1845, then was arrested in June the next year, and was beheaded as a traitor on September 16th, 1846, less than a year after his arrival. Thomas Tre was only able to enter Korea, already a priest, at the end of 1849, spent over 10 years walking around the southern regions, ministering to the scattered Christians, finally died of exhaustion on June 15, 1861, aged 40. Today, Andrew Kim is celebrated as a martyr of blood, and Thomas Tre said to be a martyr of sweat. Let's change slide. Skip paragraph. Okay. So both men were born in 1821. Che Yang being born a little earlier on March the 1st. Kim De Gun was born on August 21st. Thomas was born in Chongyangun in South Chungchong province, rural area lying between Buyo and Kungju. Andrew was born in the same province in Sonmen which lies between Danjin and Asa. But neither stayed very long in his birthplace. In 1827 already, Thomas's family moved first to Kondok Dong in Seoul, then, no, that was outside of Seoul then, and then to Kangwondo, finally to Bupyong near Incha. At about the same time, Andrew's family left Seoul then. after a time near Seoul, they settled in Yongin, a little to the south of Seoul in Kongi province. Next slide. Similarly, both were the children of pioneering Catholic families. Thomas's family, his father, St. Francis Chue was born in 1805, uh, and his grandfather, Che Han Il, had learned about the faith from Yi Chang, Chang, uh, a Christian named Ludovico Gonzago, and he was the great evangelizer of the region and had been baptized together with his family already in 1787. That was only a couple of years after the church had been established in Korea on the return from Beijing of Peter E. Sung Hun, who had been baptized there in 1784. <coughs> Thomas's mother, the Blessed Mary E. Sung was born in 1801, and she was a member of that same E. John Chang's family, and she married Thomas's father when she was just 17. Andrew's family had an even older Catholic pedigree. His older great uncle, Kim Jong Chan, had become a believer at the very start in 1784 5. Then he converted Andrew's younger great uncle, Kim Han Chan, who was later martyred in prison in Daegu in 1816. Not much seems to be known about the family of Andrew's mother. She was known always as Go Ursula. In later years, both of Thomas's parents and Andrew's father, St. Ignatius Kim Jae-jun, were martyred in 1839. Since the first baptism in 1785, the Korean Catholics have been asking the bishop in Beijing to send them priests so that they could have access to the full range of sacraments beyond baptism, but in vain. The church in China was also undergoing violent persecution at that time. Finally, a Chinese priest, James Zhao Enmo, was able to enter Korea at the end of 1794, but since foreigners, even Chinese, were not allowed to enter the country, he had to stay hidden. And even most Korean Catholics never knew that there was a priest in Seoul. Then when the violent persecution broke out in 1801, he surrendered to the authorities who had learned of his presence, hoping that the persecution would then end. He was martyred, but the persecution did not then stop. So from 1801, the Koreans kept writing to Beijing and to Rome, asking for priests in vain. Finally, in 1831, the Pope asked the Paris Foreign Mission Society to take responsibility for the Korean mission. 
Next slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Paris Foreign Mission Society. The French church was still struggling to recover from the French Revolution. There were few volunteers for missionary work, but finally, uh, some would be missionaries were found. The problem was how they could enter such a closed country. So, for several years, French missionaries hoping to enter Korea lived in Manchuria, where the Catholic Church was already established. And the first apostolic vicar, Bishop Bruyere, died there before he could enter Korea. Finally, in mid-January 1836, the first French missionary to enter Korea, Father Pierre Mobot, reached Seoul, and he immediately began to look for young Koreans who might be prepared for the priesthood. So on February the 6th of that year, Thomas Che Yamo arrived at Father Mobot's house, one month later, on March the 14th, he was joined by another Korean, Francis Xavier Che Banjie. Kim Dae-gon had not yet even been baptized. In April, Father Mobon baptized him near his home in Yongin. Wow. On July 11, Andrew Kim became the third candidate to enter Father Mobon's house. So all three of them set about studying the Latin they would need if they were to follow the courses in philosophy and theology required to become priests. It was clear that such studies could not be undertaken in Korea. Thinking that perhaps something would be possible in Manchuria, uh, Father Mobon decided to send them there. And on December the 2nd, 1836, the three young men took a vow of obedience and stability. It's the next slide. Yeah. That's the vow, that's the text of the vow they took. And on the following day, they set off for China, arriving on December 28th in the house in Manchuria, where the French priest, Father Chaston, was waiting to enter Korea, which he finally did in 1837. Next. It was decided that they would be able to study in the relative security of the Portuguese territory of Macau where the Paris Foreign Mission Society had its far eastern headquarters, there is, alas, no record of their adventures as they crossed the whole length of China on foot. It's hard to imagine how they survived. Three teenagers, no money, no maps, no contacts, and no Chinese. But alas, there's no record of their adventures. It took them then six months. They arrived in Macau, June 7, 1837. Next slide. In Macau, they entered a community composed of three or four French priests. There have been French missionaries in Indochina since the 17th century, and there were a few in different parts of China too. This was the central headquarters, but Macau was Portuguese. And uh, the Pope had long ago, centuries before, given the Portuguese king the sole authority over the church in the Far East. Portuguese bishops and priests demanded exclusive rights, and there was much friction with the French. The three, French, the three young Koreans then could not be sent to the Portuguese run seminary in Macau. The French priests created a temporary seminary for Korea based in their house. The procurator of the headquarters was at that time Father Pierre-Louis Le Grechois, and they were mainly taught by him, also Father Joseph Marie Calary and Father Libois, Napoleon Lebo. And the letters that they later wrote were almost all addressed to Fathers Libois and Le Grechois, whom they clearly loved and respected equally. Like in every Catholic seminary at the time, classes were taught in Latin, and there was little time or encouragement for the boys to learn French. The shock came when on November 27, 1837, or soon after their arrival, Che Bang suddenly died of a fever. If the two remaining young men were to become priests, they would have to complete courses first in philosophy, then in theology. In 1839, tensions were rising between China and Britain over the British imports of opium from India. 
it seemed likely that Macau might be seen of armed conflict. So on April the 6th, 1839, the Korean students left Macau with two French priests for safety in the Philippines. They arrived in Manila April 19th, and from May 3rd, they resumed studies at a farm, the Lolomboy farm, outside of Manila, at the invitation of the head of the Dominicans in Manila. And there's now a Saint Kim Dagon shrine there, uh, I think funded by Korea. Once it was clear that Macau would not be affected by the ongoing war, the priests and students returned home already in November that same year. They could not, of course, have had any idea that during that time, those months, on September 21, 1839 in Seoul, Bishop Albert had been martyred together with Fathers Mobon and Chastel. Bishop Ferriol de Manchuria would succeed Bishop Ambert as the third head of the Korean Apostolic Vicariat, but the news only became known several years later. And the father of Kim Dae Gun and the parents of Thomas Che uh, were also victims of that 1839 Gihe persecution. But they didn't know that until much later, of course. On January the 8th, 1840, a young French missionary, Father Ambroise Mestre, arrived in Macau, helped teach the seminarians, and it was soon decided that he too should become a missionary in Korea. On February the 15th, 1842, Andrew and Father Mestre left Macau on board a ship, Le Ligon, a French frigate, captained by Captain Cécile, and he seemed at that moment interested in establishing contact with the Korean government. And he needed an interpreter or two. Uh, Andrew didn't speak much French. So far, the mess was communicating. And they hoped to benefit from his planned visit to enter Korea, and hence the rush. Next. Uh, this is the point at which both Thomas and Andrew began to write letters in Latin, first to Father Le Grégeois, who had left Macau for France, and then also to Father Libois, who stayed in Macau. And all the letters that we have were finally sent to the Paris Foreign Mission Society headquarters in Paris and archived there. A couple of Andrew's letters only survive in French translations. For Andrew, the list of 21 letters actually includes two that do not exist. They're just mentioned in other letters. And by coincidence, there are also 21 letters written by Thomas. So arriving in Manila with Cecile, Andrew wrote his first letter to Father Le Grégeois. And the journey soon became complex. Uh, Captain Cecil kept changing his plans. After a detour via Taiwan, they reached the mouth of the Yangtze River. And meanwhile, in July 42, Thomas and a missionary from Manchuria had also left Macau aboard another French warship, La Favorite. The Koreans were supposed, in both cases, to act as interpreters if the ships ever reached Korea. And with Cecil, Andrew visited Nanjing on the actual day of the treaty signing ceremony marking the end of the first open war. He soon realized that there was no longer any hope of reaching Korea with Cecil, who now had other plans. So in September, he left that French ship and was reunited with Father Mest and Thomas in Shanghai. And they arrived then all the way up at the top uh, in Yodong, uh, northeastern China, October the 22nd, and arrived in November at the main central place, Bai Zaiji. Uh, Bishop Behol of Manchuria had built a church. This was a Catholic village. He built a church early on, made it a base for missions to the whole north. So the third apostolic vicar of Korea, Jean Ferriol, was already there, serving and waiting to be able to enter Korea. Andrew was able to enter Korea first as a deacon, staying there for several weeks. Then he set out on a small ship for China. 
They're caught in the violent storm, finally reached Shanghai by miracle. On August 17, 1845, after his arrival in Shanghai, Andrew was ordained as a priest by Bishop Perry. On August 31, 1845, Andrew boarded the ship, he called it the Raphael, it's a Korean ship on which he had come to Shanghai, and left for Korea together with Bishop Perio and another priest, Father W. After losing their way during another rough crossing, on September 28th, they reached Jeju Island, far too far to the south. And finally, they arrived at Navawi in Hansampo, um, near Kangyo, south Chungchong, on October 12th, 1845. And Father Andrew could at last begin his brief career as a missionary priest in Korea. The most important difference between the two sets of letters is that Andrew Kim's brief letter 18, 21, is the first letter to be written from inside Korea. And letter 19, is already sent from prison after his arrest in June 1846. On August 26th, he writes a last letter to Bishop Perio from prison, the 20th. And near the end of August, he writes a final letter, an exhortation address to the Catholics of Korea, 21st letter. September 15, he is finally sentenced to death for treason. And the next day, September 16, 1846, he's martyred at Senamto. Finally, in October, on October 26, his remains recovered were buried in Miline in Yong. In contrast, Thomas's seventh letter already, seventh letter is already written from inside Korea. It's a lengthy account of the situation of the church he finds there. In this respect, uh, Thomas, I think, wins the championship hands down. Andrew's letters are full of Chinese adventures, a lengthy winter voyage across the wilds to the north of Korea and Manchuria. His lengthy winter voyage across the area, his foolish, unprepared incursion into north, the north of Korea, Doiju, the extremely dangerous sea crossings from Korea to China and back. And then the end with descriptions of his rather unusual imprisonment during which he's never tortured, but treated very well. And his letters teach us therefore nothing at all about the daily life of the Korean church. It took Thomas a long time to find a way into Korea. In March 1843, after briefly entering Korea, Andrew had arrived back at Pajaiti with news of the Gihe persecution, including the death of both their fathers and Thomas's mother, heard from an envoy. And at the end of January 46, Thomas departed eastward with Father Best in a second fruitless search for a route into Korea on the eastern side. At the end of December 46, he set up again with Father Best to explore the entry route to the Uiju on the western side for the third time, but nothing was possible. In early 1847, then he arrived back at the headquarters of the Paris Foreign Mission Society, which had moved from Macau to Hong Kong. And there he translated into Latin the Acts of the Martyrs of the Gihei 1839 and Pyongyang 1846 persecution that had been prepared in Korea. <coughs> Returning to Andrew on July 30, 1847, <clears throat> Andrew had set off for Korea with Father Mess on a couple of French warships, La Victoire and La Gloire, in a fourth search for an entry routine. And um, this is not Andrew, it's Thomas. So, uh, on, Andrew, on August the 10th, those French ships ran aground near Gongunsan, just off Gongunsan. And everybody took refuge. Hundreds of men, hundreds of men, marines in the ships had to take refuge on a nearby island. And then September 12, a British ship came to rescue them from Shanghai and brought them away. The two missionaries were not allowed 
to stay behind, although they both wanted to very much. Finally, on April 15th, 1849, Thomas was ordained a priest in Shanghai. And in May, he went to an island just off the coast of Korea with Father Mess in a fifth unsuccessful search for an entry route into Korea, then returned to Shanghai. At the end of December 1849, under orders from Bishop Clerio, he departed with Father Mest in a sixth search for an entry route and finally succeeded in entering Korea, although through Uiju with the envoys who had been sent to guide him, but they said he had to leave Father Mest behind. And so Thomas returned home after 13 years away. Arriving in Seoul early in 1850, <coughs> Thomas began his ministry by giving the sacraments of the sick to Father Davery, French priest who was very ill, then went to Chungtongdo to meet the Bishop Chuperio and his boss before beginning visitations of Christian villages scattered in five provinces across um, the uh, country. We need another slide. Sure. Oh, four, that's back. Uh, uh, that's Nanjing. That's yeah, so we're uh, okay. Leave it. Leave it. <laughs> uh, his years of ministry were mainly spent, Thomas has spent, uh, spent them walking from one Christian village to another, ministering to small groups of isolated, impoverished believers. Only the torrid summer and travel was hardly possible, gave a moment's respite. Finally, on June the 15th, 1861, on his way to Seoul to report on his pastoral work, he fell ill from overwork and died at Chinchon, Chungchong, Burmans. In early November, his remains were moved to Beiron, and that's uh, where they had a seminary. And on March the 7th, 2002, he was approved as a candidate for beatification in 2004. Uh, this was approved, and on April 26, 2016, uh, the Pope proclaimed him Father Che Yang of Venerable, another step on the way toward beatification. Turning our letters, the first letter written by each of them. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Okay. Um, each letter dates from the spring of uh, 1842. Andrews from the end of February, Thomas is late in April. And when he writes, we're going to the letters now, Andrew has already set off on board Lady Gunn under Cecil and has reached Manila. And Andrew says he expects to leave for Korea immediately. But Thomas, still in Macau, says in his letter that Andrew is still there two months later. Thomas then writes nothing more until May 1844, by which time Andrew is writing his eighth letter, and Thomas's second letter, quite short, simply reports that they're together in Mantua. He has written nothing about the various adventures he had on the way there, whereas Andrew's multiple letters give a detailed account of the adventures and disappointments he experienced with Cecil and after parting from him. In his third letter, after September 1842, Andrew tells how he arrived with Cecil in Nanjing in time for the signing of the treaty between England and China, ending the First Opium War. And he gives a quite detailed account of the contents of the treaty. However, he says nothing at all about the ceremony itself. Maybe they arrived too late to attend. And his fourth letter, uh, although only written in Manchuria in December, describes in some detail their visit in Nanjing. Um, they weren't allowed to enter the city, but they went to see the Bounsi Temple on its outskirts with its celebrated porcelain pagoda. Um, and this account contains many details, including Chinese names, Chinese characters. So it seems that they must have had a guide who maybe wrote down the explanations. They couldn't understand each other, but they could read Chinese characters. So it seemed, uh, anyway, and maybe he took that with him. 
soon after this, and Cecil, having told him he couldn't possibly visit Korea, uh, he left the ship. And Thomas, after a time, uh, reached a similar decision. Next. Then comes an episode that shows Andrew's great self confidence. The missionaries thought this was wonderful, it's been off. <clears throat> they reached the coast of Yangning province on another ship, tiny ship, and on landing, they needed to avoid being stopped at the customs post. So they tried to avoid it by walking along the shore, but they're noticed by agents at the post who come running and try to arrest them or stop them. Andrew writes how he stepped forward and scolded them sharply for troubling innocent people. And according to one of the French companions, he spoke with considerable length and with great force. So the Chinese were abashed, apologized, and let them go free. Andrew was very clear, he was a Yamba, very eloquent, and very yeah. anyway. And the letter ends with the first vague news he had received, I hear say, through a contact of the, of the, of the deaths in the 1839 persecution of the French missionaries. And at this point, Andrew says he expects that he and Father Mess will enter Korea in December. Then a shorter fifth letter to Father Libor, written a few weeks after the fourth, repeats the initial report of the persecution. Uh, Andrew and Thomas are both now staying in Manchuria. And Andrew's sixth letter to Father de Brejra, written in mid January 43, gives a fuller account of the 1839 persecution that he had learned after meeting a key member of the Seoul Catholic community who was on his way to Beijing with an embassy. And he now knows that three French missionaries are dead, and that in addition, his own father and Thomas's two parents were martyred, but his mother is now homeless reduced to total authority. And after this meeting, he relates that he suddenly decided to enter Korea without any kind of preparation or guides. He doesn't tell us why he did that. Well, he slipped across the border, close to Oichu. He was nearly caught. And then after a couple of days, he was able to return safely to China. And this careless taking of unnecessary risks rather anticipates the way in which in 1846 he was caught. And in his seventh letter, he repeats the same story. Uh, there are no more letters written by Andrew until the eighth letter of May 1844. It's a brief letter mentioning the fact that he stayed in Bishop Period after a two month long journey to Hunchun in the far east of the country. In contrast, the ninth letter addressed to Bishop Perio, dated from mid-December 44, is a lengthy account of this long winter journey. Curiously, this letter is only preserved in the French version, with a note that claims it was originally written in Chinese. It seemed very unlikely, there's no way of knowing for sure. Anyway, shortly before he signed this letter, he and Thomas had been ordained as deacons. The Hong Chun Travel Journal is a remarkable account of a winter journey across the frozen wasteland of the area to the north of the Korean border. It shows Andrew's sharp eye for the natural landscape, his critical view of the mainly poor pagan people he encouraged, including his experience of the superstitious Chinese ways for celebrating the Lunar New Year. He was then able to meet some Korean Christians at the Kyongwon Fair, but it's very brief, without really being able to talk because of the crowd around them listening. So ultimately, this long journey was fruitless, and the Western entry through Uriju remained the only overland method of entry. Korea. Thomas wrote briefly twice to Father Louis Grigio, 44, and at the end of 46, simply to tell him that he was still 
in Manchuria, waiting for a chance to enter Korea. Meanwhile, Andrew had been able finally to enter Korea properly in January 1845 with guides and reached Seoul. From where he wrote his tenth letter about the adventure of his arrival in Oichu, where he nearly lost contact with the guides at Seoul. On arriving in Seoul, he fell ill, and then set about preparing a boat in which to return to China. He was, wasn't yet a priest, he had to get back. On April 6, 1845, he wrote about his 11th letter, telling him some more details of the death of the three French missionaries in 1839, explaining also the political background to that persecution. And the 12th letter, dated the following day, continues to explain factional infighting in the Great Court. The 13th and 14th letters are brief notes from Shanghai to Bishop Libo, Father Libo, Bishop Perio, dated June 45 to 4, the day he arrived in Shanghai after a dramatic journey from Korea by ship to a great storm. In the long 16th letter of July 23rd, 45, also written in Shanghai, he tells Father Libo about the crossing in dramatic detail. It was truly a miracle that they did not hold the ground. And he sends with a letter a lengthy Latin account of the Korean martyrs that he had brought with him, the translation of materials collected by Christians in Seoul. He had presumably translated it from Korean during his time in Seoul. It had survived the sea crossing. The short 17th letter was written the same day to Bishop Perio, who had been waiting for news of his arrival before coming to join him in Shanghai. And the equally short 18th letter of November 20 from Seoul tells Father Libra how the ship on which he was returning to Korea with Bishop Perio of Cavalry had lost its way in another storm arriving off Jeju Island. He had been ordained a priest just before the Shanghai. His next letter, fairly short 19th letter, July 1846, was already written in prison. It's essentially a letter of farewell addressed to his four main French correspondents, Father Bernard de Manchuria, who would later take over as apostolic vicar, after the death of Peter Ferio in 1833, Father Mest was still waiting to enter Korea, and the usual um, the Fathers Libra and the Rejo. Andrew clearly expects to be condemned, executed, after a short description of his arrest, bids each of them a farewell, including Thomas in his message as well. And then, on August 26, 1846, he writes to Bishop in much further detail about his arrest and interrogations, also mentioning the other arrested with him and martyred uh, because of him. Toward the end, he makes it plain that far from being tortured, he's being given really good treatment, and he even has to translate an English map to be given to the king. However, he has been told that, no, not yet. No. Um, he has been told that the French ship had come to the Korean coast. And ends by warning the bishop that such ineffectual uh, brief visits, followed by rapid departures, give a very poor image of France and can only harm the Korean church, convincing the authorities that Catholics are agents of foreigners. And the irony of the situation is that the commander of the ship in question was none other than Captain Ceci whom he had first embarked in that attempt to enter Korea. Cecile could not, of course, have known that Andrew had entered Korea and was now about to be executed. Andrew's execution was finally decided 
by the emotion at court provoked by the arrival of Captain Sissi. Andrew was executed on September 16, 1846, the day following delivery of the sentence. He was not executed as a Christian, but as a traitor, mainly probably because of his unauthorized stay in China and his contact with foreigners. He was therefore given the formal military ritual with St. Anto instead of a simple beheading outside the small escape social movement. So, so finally, October 26th, his remains were recovered by Catholic believers and he was buried in Merine, Yongi, a Christian village. Andrew's final 21st letter is not in fact a letter, but a kind of exhortation written in Korean addressed to the faithful of the Korean church. It's striking that all of Andrew's letters, including the account of his arrest in the 20th letter, show the same ability to relate clearly and calmly all the adventures that have happened to him. But tell us virtually nothing in detail about the people involved, the people he meets, whether visiting Nanjing, crossing the snowbound wastes of Manchuria, venturing unaccompanied into Korea, or carelessly allowing himself to be spotted and arrested on a remote Korean island, he's always equally calm and, above all, self assured. One source of the trouble leading to his arrest was his determined claim that he was high class Yangba deserving respect. But that confidence of the Yangba was also visible when he was shouting at the agents of that customs post in northern China. So what might be felt to be lacking in his letters is any really religious, spiritual dimension or a real interest in ordinary people's lives. True, during the storm at sea, he baptizes one of the sailors, fearing they might all drown, and invokes the Virgin Mary, but he has nothing to say, for example, of the life in the Christian villages in China, where he spent quite some time. Also, nothing of the Christian community in Seoul, but welcomed him and prepared the report of the martyrs that he translated. Ah, uh, not, not wanting to be disrespectful, Andrew's accounts of his adventures sometimes read like something written by an adventurous young man fresh out of school, traveling the world before settling down. The tone often seems to be saying, look where I've been, see what I've done. Uh, equally striking is the way he always has something to blame if things go wrong. It was Captain Cecil who decided to visit Angie. At the customs post, he was accompanied by Father Mestre and Alvarez. Telling Father Livois about his journey across Manchuria, he specifies at the start that he was sent by the most illustrious bishop. And when writing to his four correspondents, his farewell letter after his arrest, he begins by specifying that he had gone to that offshore island as his excellency bishop Perio ordered me to and the only exception is the full hardy excursion to oiju created in the seventh letter that he does seem to have undertaken entirely on his own on the spur of the moment after meeting that korean envoy and hearing of the death of his father Anyway, Bishop Ferio reckoned that uh, Andrew Kim was not foolhardy, but audacious, and not uh, arrogant, but uh, eloquent. So he definitely approved. But then uh, Bishop Ferio also mm -hmm. wrote after his death that he reckoned if he'd gone on being a priest, people would have forgotten that he was Korean. So Bishop Ferio, before he died from exhaustion in 1853, asked to be buried beside Andrew, saying, you will never know how sad I was to lose this young native priest. I loved him 
as a father loves his son. It's a consolation for me to think of this eternal happiness. Uh, okay, we go here. Uh, yeah. Anyway, late in December, you know, and Thomas finally slipped past the guards at Rachel. Now that's good. That's Rachel. That's that's where they had to get to. <clears throat> Thomas finally slipped past the guards uh, and was brought to Seoul by the Christians who were waiting for him, but they wouldn't let Father Esther in, saying it too dangerous. So Thomas was able to write his seventh letter to Father the Prisoner from Seoul. October 1st, 1850. At last, we can feel him full of joy, being finally able to write the letter he'd been wanting to write for so many years. He was home. And this long letter is already full of his experiences as he ministers to the Catholics scattered across the country. It and those that follow are very unlike Andrew's stories of adventure, risk, and travel. Thomas, after all, alone can minister to Koreans as a Korean, with no need to hide his long beard and long nose like the French, without any barrier due to language or culture. He can walk along freely without hiding his face in mourning dress. Yet, of course, still, he has to be very careful. Next. So the seventh letter begins with his account of his entry, or he was slipping past the darkness on a bitterly cold night. Arriving in Seoul, he immediately discovers the health problems the French missionaries are having. Father Davily was so sick, he feels obliged to give him the last rites in case he died, and the bishop took his sick. Then he leaves for Chola province, where there were many Christians living in scattered villages, he starts by describing two places where local pagan village heads took him for a European for some reason, wanted to arrest him. But in both cases, he was able to slip away by night without having time to celebrate mass for the waiting faithful to his and their great distress. He usually celebrated mass around three in the morning and then finally. Uh -huh. uh, so he goes on to describe the poverty in which the Catholics are living, driven from their homes and families as Christians living in rough, remote villages. The difficulties will be leavers face, evoking the cases of two women, the first of them having left her highly class home in search of some other Christians one day after hearing about them, was kidnapped by a pagan on the road and forced to live with him for 12 years. And then a Christian heard about her situation and was able to give her some books so that she could learn more about faith and have some prayers to recite that nothing more was possible. The second woman who'd been baptized was confined. She was high class and for 19 years, she was never allowed to leave the house alone although she was longing for the sacraments in vain. And she used to hold a piece of European, imported European cloth and pray that European priests might come to Korea one day. So hearing from a Christian about her, Father Chair went all the way to visit her, but he had to be quick. So instead of her making a sp spoken confession to save time, she wrote out her examination of conscience sent it to him ahead. He found a moment when there were no other adults in the house, slipped in, gave her absolution, gave her communion, slipped out again. It goes on to note uh, how hard it is for nobles to become Christian believers because of all that they have to lose. He quotes one recent convert who had been given an unexpected official position, explaining that he, like any official, would be obliged to participate in official rituals forbidden to Catholics, so that he despaired of seeing him continue the faith. The material and social rewards available to the young man were so great. 
And in this letter, he returns to the plight of the high class women who could never leave home. They don't work in the fields, they don't go shopping. He explains that all the Christians are eager for confession and communion, and they travel great distances for them. Become very upset once the priest is leaving again. He moves on to another topic the wish of many young Christian women to live as virgins. Among the early Catholics, virginity was highly prized, and the priests often felt obliged to urge the women to marry, since Korean society had no place for unmarried women. And this leads into the long story of Baba clever girl who decided not to marry when she was just seven years old. And the years pass, she practices extreme forms of fasting, praying, hiding in the hills to pray all night long. The French priests and the bishop do not take her seriously. They obviously think she's deluded, tell her she must marry, even refuse her the sacraments because she disobeys them. Finally, Father Che visits her. Again, he urges her to be reasonable. Then suddenly, she falls ill. She's clearly dying. She's only 18. And he gives her the sacraments, extreme unction. She dies, and he's overwhelmed with sorrow. Next. Finally, he talks about himself. Since arriving in Korea some 10 months before, he has walked about 5,000 leagues, 2,000 kilometers. He has visited 3,800 Christians. 1,700 have received communion from him, all in small groups. And he ends by uh, describing the overall situation. And he asks Father Le Grégeois to send him sacred pictures, crosses, and so on. That was from the previous, the previous slide. Yeah. And crosses to help the faithful pray. What strikes most in this letter is his acute awareness of hardship. Believers are prepared to face for their faith. The compassion he feels for their sufferings, his admiration for their intense piety, that can very rarely be confirmed by a visit from a priest or reception of sacraments. The Christian life was mostly lived at home, alone, with a few family members, if possible, among a tight community of believers. There's a hint in this letter of tension between him and the French missionaries. For example, concerning the evaluation of Barbara's intense piety, and he was, after all, fully aware that the bishop had refused to give her absolution and communion four times, implied that he considered her misguided and disobedient. But Father Chair seems only too glad to have had the excuse of her sudden illness to give her the sacraments. And his response to her death expresses real admiration and affection. I will never forget her beauty and devotion. Next. The eighth letter, written one year later in October 1857, gives many more details of the difficulties and trials faced by Christians. One especially interesting passage uh, is his translation of the response from the Korean government to the letter Captain Cecile had sent to the ministers after the shipwreck describing Porter, giving the government's reasons for the execution of the three missionaries in 1839. But still more interesting is his detailed account of the life and martyrdom of his uh, own parents, which he felt did not be properly covered in previous accounts sent to the French. Uh, this very lengthy account has to be read before we cannot be summarized. His father finally died in prison, 1839, as a result of torture. His mother was executed before. 
The short tenth letter is dated two years later, November 1854. A French priest had arrived, only to fall sick and die at once, leaving them as undermanned as ever. Then another year passes, the 11th letter of October 1855. Written to Father Lucretia, it too is quite short, simply reports things are going well. He was, he's baptized 240 adults. And then he notes that converts from the upper Yangban class tend to lapse easily <coughs> because as Christians, they lose too much, becoming poor after being rich, losing the pleasures wealth made possible and find themselves finally forced to return to their previous lives because of hunger and poverty. And ends after adding a few more details about the death of his parents. Another two years pass, then in September 56, he writes again, reporting the arrest of five Christians from a village in Cholla, before giving a long account, very long account, of the martyrdom of a man back in 1839. He ends by stressing that for many other martyrs, there are not enough eyewitness accounts. Then the 13th letter of September 1857 tells of the multiple difficulties Christians suffer and mentions an instance in which he was nearly captured. The key element in this letter, though, is a complaint he voices against the previous French bishop for the way he surrounded himself with assistants who were the young man word, arrogant, and he says, hated by all, loved by Bishop Pierio, and they alone were his confidential assistants. And he goes on to explain why he was so against trusting doing jobs to the young man. There are some who judge the social customs of the Korean people to be good. Customs according to which all the rights which the nobles claim should be granted to them. And as for the common people, commoners must be compelled to directly hand over all that the nobles demand. Thus, the proud should always be favored for being proud, and the red sheet must always be compelled to be even hungry. The spirit of Christ is then degraded. Christ who always sides with the poor and the abject, but shows himself more severe to the proud and the powerful. Strong words. Now, the Father's tone, Father Che's tone is tentative. He doesn't want to be seen to be anti French, but his position as the only Korean priest must have been really delicate, and he knows what he knows. Uh, Thomas's 16th letter to Father Bourgeois, dated 1858, October, begins with the sickness and death of Father Mest at the end of uh, 1857. After so many journeys together, they must have been especially close. He was surely very sad to see him die only 49 years old. At the same time, he writes a brief uh, 17th letter to Father Bourgeois about a man from Jeju Island who shipwrecked in China had learned about the faith there and was now intending to spread the gospel at home. A year later, October 1859, he writes again to Father Grishwaz stories of how various pagans had become believers, as well as a description of a night in which he and a group of companions were attacked by satellites and he was left alone companions were taken to the magistrate, but the magistrate said, I don't know. Next. So the short 19th letter of the same moment to Father Lee only mentions the bishop for health, his own weakening body. He longs for the European powers to come and oblige Korea to open the mission as China has been forced to do after the end of the Second World War in 1860. The brief 20th letter to Bishop Bayerol in Manchuria, also October 59, 
evokes the overall situation and asks for prayers. And so the final 21st letter is addressed to both Holy Libra and the Virgil. This is 1860. Father Che is in hiding because the persecution has broken out, no longer involving multiple executions, but with arrests and constant harassment, forcing believers up into the hills to leave on the hidden villages being attacked and burned. The government had been able to sow distrust of Catholics among the general population that had previously been rather sympathetic to them. He returns to the great dangers facing isolated women believers. He quotes an example also of a family of 14 that has long, that has lost everything. And that letter ends with a prayer for God's help. He's acutely aware of the suffering involved in being a Christian and the risks of a greater persecution to come. And the following year, as he was on his way to Seoul to report to the bishop, overcome with fatigue, suffering from typhus, he lay dying in a village not far from the seminary at Dieron, where the French missionary Father Fouquier was living. Father Fouquier heard the news, came rushing, and was able to give him the last rites as he lay dying, able only to pronounce the names of Jesus and Mary. Father Che died on June 14, 1861, aged just 40. In the November following, his remains were taken to Veron and reburied there. His grave is still visible. It was only in 2002 when the Catholic Church decided he might deserve to be beatified. That was approved in Rome in 2004. In 2014, the Pope recognized his qualities authorized that he be termed the venerable as the last step before the application. And so far, the Korean church has pushed in vain for the application. The recent publication of his letters, us in English, is intended to give an extra push to the process. Last time. Uh, 200 years after Thomas's birth, uh, today seeing in his letters such intense compassion for the sufferings of the impoverished believers he met, his deep admiration for the way in which they practice the faith, his veneration for otherwise completely forgotten humble Christian lives, his burning desire to give them access to the sacrament walking hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, year after year, I can't help feeling that he is by far the greater saint of the two. But then meanwhile, in heaven, Adam laughs and tells him that he reckons he was only canonized so fast because you know, Koreans always want gold medals. And he died 15 years before him, so he came in first. <laughs> <laughs> and the venerable Thomas Trey laughs back and says he doesn't really care about titles, but he does hope the Korean Catholics always remember how important loving, sharing community is and never let themselves be bullied by wealthy younger. <laughs> Anthony, thank you very much. I'm going to let you just call on questions yourself. I don't need to intermediate that. So, questions? Is there, uh, I'm assuming in the letter he describes the fact that the government had encouraged uh, more negative attitudes among the people. Is there other documentation like the Official records. Uh, I, 
I don't have access to Chinese language texts, so I don't know the official text. <clears throat> what you, because there, there are two things. In some of the letters, <clears throat> both he and Abu Kim are hearing people say, if only the French would come and liberate us, take over them, because there's so much corruption. Life is so difficult under this young man, privileged, ruling class. At least the French came and really, you know, like in China, because everybody knew what, what had happened in China. <clears throat> um, and there is that. But uh, the government, I think, was able, as we hear in some of the letters, the government was able to play the anti foreigner thing. And it's right through, it goes on, you see, until 1866 and 1871. Whenever the foreign ship came, whether it's the French expedition in 1866 or the American expedition in 1871, okay, they kill some Koreans, the Americans kill several hundred Koreans, and they leave. We won. The foreign devils have surrendered to our superior power because the French, they took one look at where Seoul was because they know that it seems so. So they, in 1866, they sailed up the river. It's, it's, it's miles from the river. You need an army of thousands with, with artillery if you're going to take uh, say that. Um, but I think you know, it was quite easy for them them to say uh, the, the foreigners come because the Catholics ask them. Because that was, you see, already in 1839, so better. 1809. 1801. 1801. Yeah, or, you know, 1801. <coughs> Juan wrote this long, long silk letter on a piece of silk. Uh, very small writing. Uh, to the Pope. Uh, at the end, it, he said it would be good if, if the Western power sent some battleships, gunship, to sort of impose freedom. And of course, this the, the government got the letter, and but from that point on, they never forgot that the Catholics were, in some sense, agents or potential agents of the foreign power. And uh, when it came to it, The, the one letter that was, well, you said it was an exhortation written in Korean. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't see that far away. Was it in Hangul or Hanta? Hangul. Hangul. In, in 18, uh, what was written by Andrew. We don't have the original. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's lost. Okay. So uh, what, what you have is, is from about, well, it was discovered by a French missionary around 1880. But uh, it's the same text because yeah, yeah. in Dalia's book from 1874, there's a translation of that. And it's the same text. Same. Uh, so whatever text you know, it, it's lost, but it, it is in hand. It's the only one. Uh, how hopeful are you that the beatification process will proceed? I don't really know. <laughs> that's that's Rome's problem for the higher the hierarchy. Uh, they keep pushing, they keep pushing. Uh, but they, I think they need a miracle. Uh, they don't, I, uh, not, there's, uh, there's no miracle. Oh, Thomas Chad had to have done a miracle. You're, no, well, somebody has to be sick and pray to mm -hmm. him. To pray. Oh, okay. So something. Uh, uh, there's supposed to be, uh, I oh. think, only one miracle. Did Andrew Kim go through the first process of the venerabilization and the application? 
Andrew Kim. Andrew Kim. Andrew was Kim. He, Andrew Kim be, was became the venerable Andrew Kim, 1854. Oh. The, the French priests loved Andrew Kim. Uh, Bishop Theriot, there's a very long letter in French by Bishop Theriot, all about him and his life. And uh, wonderful. And um, they somehow got through. And so he was, in, but of course, I mean, then he had to wait all that time to it. He wasn't canonized until 1984, with everybody else. Yeah, it was beatification, the blessed. I mean, we had 103 blessed for all those years, some from the 1920s. There was a first beatification in Rome, a good number in, in the 1920s, and then again, early 60s. Yes, so adding up to three. So, <clears throat> but um, does it matter? No. Entitlement. One thing that struck me, and this kind of not it's outside of the context of the letters and the materials that you look at, probably, but that they had. They couldn't find a route into Korea. I mean, the, the, the shoreline is thousands of kilometers. They couldn't find any way to sneak in. I mean, were there, were there that many guards and walls along the whole no, the seashore? There was nothing. There was a huge wasteland stretching all the way across. So and they delivered, there was a deliberate policy and it was totally uninhabited. And that is extremely wild. Read the account of his journey across the North Manchuria. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you needed some kind of track to, to get through. And of course, it was also that you had to have a place where the creek. So that was why <clears throat> they kept wanting to be able to come in by ship. But the Chinese ships, the fishing boats of the Chinese, came very close, but they never set foot because they weren't allowed. Some things never change. Huh? Some things never change. Chinese fishing boats. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have the proper masks, but um, no, no, they, they were. And um, the Koreans were not allowed to meet uh, the, the Chinese fishermen. Yeah. Uh, so. The, the dream for a long time was, I hope so, well, it, it did come across there to Shanghai, pick up those two missionaries, bring them back. <coughs> well, Tom, the Koreans had no experience. He had a crew of 11 in that boat. None of them had ever out been in the open sea. How they did it, you know, it's mm -hmm. incredible. This is a tiny ship, no nails. No names. And they had a dinghy, even though they had to cut that off and masks, they had to cut the masks down. Wow. That's the most dramatic. Would be both dramatic and traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what they did in the movie. Anyone see the movie? Is there a movie? Yeah. There's a movie. Ah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, no, no. I, I looked after that. I see. Uh, Big storm. No, in both ways, because you know, then they got. I mean, they didn't have any maps, charts, anything. So, but what's that island? Oh, teacher Go north. And everything took forever. Everything took forever. To months. What's your next project in regards to Brother St. Andrew, not Brother St. Andrew, and the Venerable Thomas? Yeah. What's your next project regarding Catholic Church oh, history? I, 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 we punish, well, <clears throat> the main problem is that it, you can't, it doesn't go in Amazon. It's published in Korea by a very small operation, a younger shop. 
have done so maybe later <coughs> uh, if we could combine the two sets in a single volume that, that could be published overseas that might I don't know. We, we had a history of the Catholic Church, but that only goes up to the mid 1700s. No, well, the, the, the big history, the two volumes. I'm talking about the one that we had in, in our RAS publications. There was a small one volume. In English, it's translated from French or something. Oh. That, that was Medina. Medina, yeah, yeah. No. That's not. That's <coughs> that was more about the uh, Imjin Wera time. Okay. But uh, there was virtually no contact. There were, there was at least one Cespedes came that he was a military chaplain for the Japanese. Oh, okay. If he met Koreans, it would only have been prisoners in Japan. <coughs> but um, in 1874, Ushar Dalle. Published his two volumes, Histoire de l'Église, which I have now translated, and we are working on that. Well, thank you again very much for sharing with us.